come here to this place, they're just saturated more and more uh, with the Word of God. And so if you didn't grab one, feel free to get up during the opening hymn and go get one if you want. Uh, No one's going to look sideways at you or anything like that for getting up. It's fine. All right. We will begin our service here today then with our hymn of invocation, Jesus Sinners Doth Receive. We'll sing the first three verses. I invite you to rise as you're able as we make our beginning today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I'm heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious. 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated for the readings. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 55. If you'd like to follow along in the Bibles in your pews, this reading can be found on page 615. Page 615, Isaiah 55, beginning with the 10th verse. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord." an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now our epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 8. In your bulletin, it says that this reading starts on page 942. That's a little bit of a typo. It actually starts on page 944. Page 944, Romans 8, beginning with verse 12. Paul writes then, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, though, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we join in singing our Alleluia. Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. This reading can be found on page 888 in your pew Bibles. Page 888, John 4, beginning with the first verse. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. And so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, though, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Because the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. 
Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? And so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and they were coming to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We now get to confess our common Christian faith. We do so today using the words of the Nicene Creed, which you can find printed on the inside back cover of your hymnal. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sat at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in the holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue now with our hymn of the day, finishing hymn number 609, Jesus Sinners Doth Receive.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours today. From God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A few weeks ago, we heard about a foreigner who had come to Israel in order to be cured of his leprosy. We talked about uh, Naaman, the Syrian commander who, without payment or price, obeyed the simple word of God. He washed himself in the waters of the Jordan River and was made clean. God has washed us as well, also in the, the, the waters of baptism, making us pure and clean children of God through the perfect life, the perfect death, the perfect resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so today, we look at another journey. We look at another foreigner. We look at another one who has learned about God's kingdom and learns about it through water. Before we get to that, though, I want you to remember back to the beginning for a moment. When Adam and Eve sinned, God put a, a curse upon the ground. And ever since then, all of us, and every one of us in the human family, we have all suffered hardship, we've suffered toil, difficulty, exhaustion, all of that as a result of that curse. And this includes the Son who was promised to us all the way back in Genesis 3. God's Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, He experienced that same curse that God laid on the ground, he experienced it just as we do. That means that he knew what it meant to be hungry. He knew what it meant to be thirsty. And as Jesus is journeying from Judea to Galilee, he becomes so exhausted from this journey that he stopped by a well to rest while his disciples went on ahead of him into town in order to buy lunch. Just as with many of the days of this summer so far, I'm sure the idea of cool water kept that way deep beneath the surface of the ground, was very inviting, but the well was deep. Jesus didn't have anything with him to draw the water from, and so, thankfully enough, someone comes along. He sees a woman approaching him, even late in the day. Verses 7 through 9 open up the conversation as it says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone on into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Why did Jews, why did Jesus' people not have any dealings with Samaritans? Well, there's a long and long and bitter history between those two nations. It started out actually as punishment. For one of the Jews' great kings, David's son Solomon. See, as we've been talking about marriage recently in our Bible class, some have asked about the extravagant polygamy that God allowed Jerusalem's kings to engage in. Well, Solomon was known for having quite a bit more than a few. More than that, though, he married many foreign women, and he built places of worship for their false gods there in Jerusalem. In order to appease his many foreign wives, he let the religious views and practices that were opposed to God into his lands, giving legitimacy to these false gods. And so after Solomon's death, God split the kingdom of Israel into two. There was Judah in the south and the ten tribes of Israel in the north. The capital of Jerusalem was in, or the capital of Judah was Jerusalem, and in time the capital of Israel became Samaria. Its habit, inhabitants then were called Samaritans. Now it didn't take long before that northern kingdom just outright rejected God altogether and began to worship the gods of all these foreign nations. And when they did, God sent them many prophets, people like Elijah and the prophet Elisha, who healed Naaman the Syrian and all these others in order to warn them. But Israel and all of her kings refused to listen, refused to return in repentance to the God of Israel, and so he brought in foreigners, the Assyrians, who captured Israel, and they took all the survivors out into exile where they were lost to history. That's why they're known sometimes as the Lost Ten Tribes. In their place, though, the Assyrian king brings in all sorts of people whom he had exiled from other nations that he had conquered, kind of trying to erase the heritage of all these different nations and force them all to sort of become something new under him and him alone. And these Gentiles then, these outsiders, they lived in Samaria. They married the few Israelites who remained in the land. And so the people in the southern kingdom of Judah, they considered all of these neighbors to the north up in Samaria half-breeds. 
They treated them with contempt for all of their sin and their rebellion. But later then, the southern kingdom of Judah was exiled to Babylon because of its own idolatry. When God returned them to Jerusalem, returned them there to rebuild the temple after 70 years, the Samaritans actually come by and offer help. They said, we'll help you rebuild. Let us us, us give you a hand as you get things started. But the people of Judah, because of their contempt for them, they refused, still remembering that sort of half-breed status and holding it against them. And so the Samaritans, rather than helping them out, they actually became hostile. They worked to to, to hinder the efforts to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city, and made all kinds of violent threats against them as well. And the people of Judah, they never forgot. And neither did the Samaritans. So the hostility between the Jews and Samaritans, it continued on for centuries, all the way up until Jesus' day. And so it's no wonder the Samaritan woman asks Jesus in verse 9, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? A woman of Samaria. But notice how Jesus responds to that. He says, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. Rather than dwell on the troubled history of Jews and Samaritans, rather than even focus on the water in the well that she was drawing up, Jesus turns the conversation away from worldly things, turns them towards spiritual things, and the identity of the man who was sitting in her midst. But she missed the turn. She thought that he was talking about some some special water, something much sweeter or purer than the water from this well. She knew that Jesus was talking about a different kind of water, but still very clearly talking about water. She took great pride in the fact, actually, that this this well had provided good water to her and her people for, for a very long time. This well had been dug by the patriarch Jacob himself. The the Jacob of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob fame. He drank the water from this well himself. He gave it to his 12 sons, the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Even though she was a Samaritan, she still claims that same heritage of Abraham, Isaac, and yes, even Jacob as her own. She still held those patriarchs in high regard. And now this Jew, this stranger, is claiming to be better than Jacob, offering a new, a new kind of water, a better kind of water than, than the one that Jacob gave. You can sense the skepticism in her reply. But Jesus continues in verse 13. He says, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become a, a spring of water that will well up to eternal life. See, she's clinging to earthly things, earthly things like ancestry, the claiming of heroes of old as a source of pride, a source of hope. And so Jesus points out the silliness in focusing on this well and the water that she's putting so much stock in. Once again, as Jesus brings eternal life into the conversation, he has made this turn to point her to spiritual things. He's not really all that concerned about physical earthly water, even though he himself is thirsty. Instead, he's focused on living water, one that satisfies more than just a dry mouth. It satisfies a parched and thirsty soul. But the woman still clings to her earthly physical water. Verse 15, she says, sir, give me this water then, so that I won't be thirsty. I won't have to come here and draw water anymore. Even if we drew water from wells like they did, We still enjoy the blessing of indoor plumbing. And for her, it still took a lot of work, though, to carry that water jar to the well, to then draw up the water, fill the jar, and carry it back home. Living water, though, that makes someone never thirsty again? I won't ever have to make this trip again? I won't have to do this work anymore? That's a magic trick worth giving a shot, at least. But to break through her hardened heart, then, Jesus turns the conversation a little more to try to get her to understand. Verses 16 through 18, he says, Go and call your husband. 
right? Because it would be inappropriate for him to sit here and have this conversation and continue on, especially at length, about the things that he's talking about without her husband there. And so he says, go call your husband. Call him and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. And in that we begin to see actually the deep spiritual thirst that lays within her. That Jesus has been wanting her to consider. Gently, he reveals her sin. Now, having had, having had five husbands doesn't automatically make this woman a terrible, sinful person or anything like that. In that day, men could divorce their wives for just about any reason they wanted. If the woman couldn't give him children, if married life proved too heavy of a financial burden, heck, if they just saw a younger, prettier woman, they could divorce her, no questions asked. She could have been totally innocent in losing five husbands. She could have been. And perhaps death played a role in these things as well, something that she has absolutely no control over. But now she was in a relationship living with a man to whom she was not married. Jesus was clearly pointing out that in her life, she's been breaking the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. As we've been talking about in our Bible class over the past several weeks now, This was not a a sexually pure and decent life. And her living arrangement with a man without the vow, without the bond of marriage, it stood in opposition to the will of God, just as it does today. But note Jesus' goal here. Because his goal is not to hammer her over the head with it. His goal is not to humiliate her and embarrass her. He does call out her sin. Yes, that's necessary, but he, he draws out the dry desert of her soul that's created by that sin. But he does it gently. He does it not again to humiliate her. He does it to bring her to repentance, to bring her to faith. All she needed was for him to point out that the man she had was not her husband, and the law has done its work. But these were private details of her life. These were things no stranger should be able to know, which is why in verse 20, or verse 19 and 20, she sort of makes a, a distinction. She, she notices something unique about Jesus. She says, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. How else could you know? Our fathers actually worshiped on this mountain, but, but you Jews, you say that in Jerusalem, that's the place where people ought to worship. Is this a change of subject? Did Jesus hit a little too close to home with that comment about her husband causing her now to to try to talk about worship now instead of the relationship? Like, let's talk about something else. I don't need to talk about this anymore. It may be that that's the case. But more likely, Jesus used this image of water and thirst to reveal something more about her life, something deeper, as well as something new about himself. See, if she'd been so wrong in her relationships, then she needed God's mercy. But given how wrong she had been about all of those things, maybe she and her Samaritan neighbors, maybe they were all wrong about how they sought out God, how they sought out His mercy. See, God had told Israel that there was one place for them to worship. It was the place where the Ark of the Covenant stood inside the the tent of meeting, and then later after that it was the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. And when those ten northern tribes, when they broke away from Solomon's son, their new king, Jeroboam, he built new temples. He told the people to worship God there instead of in Jerusalem. These people who were now counted among the Samaritans. But now she's got a prophet right here in her midst. Now she can get some straight answers. And Jesus gives her answers all right. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, God had a very good reason for requiring one place of worship throughout the time of all the Old Testament people Israel. And it's because their worship would very easily turn into a law-centered, works-dominated religion of idolatry. And so God had carefully prescribed the one place where they could find him and exactly what was required for them to enter his presence through the blood of lambs and goats, bulls and other animals and all these things in place of the blood that they should have shed. All throughout the Old Testament, God's people, they were saved through faith in God's promised Savior, the Christ, who would take all of their sins upon himself and he would suffer and die in their place he was the lamb of god who carried away all the sins all the sins of the entire world but now with his coming jesus says that the old testament temple that singular one fixed location had fulfilled its purpose it did its job because its only purpose was the point ahead to him And that's why Jesus reveals that that God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. Because the location isn't singular anymore. It's not just this, this one place. It isn't fixed to one temple in one city. But it is wherever Christ is. And he promises to be wherever his people are gathered around word and sacrament. Whatever continent, whatever country, whatever mountain or valley, whatever city or village they may gather in. And as Jesus reveals all of these things to her, she continues in verse 25 then, you're talking about the Messiah. And I know that Messiah is coming. I know that he is coming who is called Christ. And when he gets here, he's going to tell us everything we need to know. The flowering of this woman's faith just in this short episode is amazing. She made the turn from from physical thirst to spiritual thirst. She made the turn from physical water to spiritual water. Imagine her heart burning within her when Jesus replies to that clear hope for the chosen one of God. I who speak to you am he. And like this Samaritan woman, We all have a deep spiritual thirst. Our sinful nature, it it drives us away from God to seek our satisfaction in all sorts of different things, whether it's people, possessions, or, or actions that we think are going to quench that thirst. But we can never fill that empty spot inside. We can never moisten it enough. It's the place that God created in us where He alone can dwell, satisfying us with with living water, forgiving our sins, bringing us true peace, true joy, true contentment. Jesus came to us and he restored our right relationship with God, our creator and our father through his innocent suffering and death. And we now have access to God through Jesus Christ. God grant us this living water always. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to rise as we now bring forward our tithes and offerings this morning. Let us now pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father of mercy, our sins 
of merited thorns and briars, and yield only trouble and strife. Forgive our transgressions and discipline us against temptation, that we may rejoice in your name and the promise of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you send forth your word as abundantly as rains upon the earth. Grant that we would never take your generosity for granted, but would seek the help and refreshment of your word in every circumstance. Bless pastors and missionaries as they proclaim your truth. Prepare the hearts of all who hear to believe and yield abundant fruit. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, bless parents with faithfulness as they plant your word into their children, that they may grow steadfast among the cares and troubles of this world. Lord, in your mercy. Creator of heaven and earth, by your word you sent forth rain and snow to make the world bring forth and sprout. Give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Provide us seasonable weather and bountiful harvest, that we may enjoy daily bread and praise your name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, look with mercy upon those who suffer from illness of body or mind. Be especially with Vern Holzauer, Mel Pierce, Faye Price, with Darlene Bassett, with Jill Leith, with Karen Jenkins. We pray also for Dick, the husband of Risa Kinney, who's having surgery this week, for Anthony Stone, the son of Charlene Drangmeister, for the family and friends of Laura Hosey, the sister of Karen Ingram, who died yesterday and also for Charlene Verrata, a frequent friend and visitor of Faith Lutheran, who is in pain and some suffering this morning. We also lift up all those whom we name silently in our hearts. Give them healing, Lord God. Comfort them with your presence. Grant them patience to endure suffering and assure them at all times that they are your dear children, and that the glory of Christ awaits them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, you have made us your holy children and freed us from bondage to the flesh. Sustain us in repentance and faith that we may receive Christ's body and blood this day for life and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your Spirit calls us by the gospel to the new life of faith. We praise you and acknowledge you as our Lord. Deliver us from the devil's temptations, that we may live under you and serve you in righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh. Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to You, Almighty God, that You have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore You that of Your mercy You would strengthen us through this same gift in faith toward You and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, Your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with You in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. seated for a few announcements. 
A reminder that our church family campout is coming up here at the beginning of August. Today is the last day. If you want to sign up for that and get a site, we do have extra sites available, and today is the last day to do so. And so if you're interested, you have any questions about that, want to get signed up, or you're unsure still a little bit, please talk to Mary Ann Klemp, who's back there with her hands up right now, and she will be happy to fill you in with everything we have going on. All right, back to school fair is coming up at the end of July. The fair itself will be on Saturday, July 29th in the morning. Uh, We are still collecting two pocket folders for that, and so I encourage you, please, as you're out doing your shopping or whatever else, especially as we're getting into that back to school time, it's easy to just scoop up a handful of them for like 10 cents or something, but um, uh, probably not that cheap, but anyways, uh, grab some extras, please, and bring them in so we can share them with uh, kids and families in our area who are in need. Uh, Beyond that, if uh, you would like to join us in sitting out at that fair and actually handing out these folders as well as uh, other information about our church and things like that, uh, please feel free to come and talk to me and let me know. Um, We have a few that are already committed, so we're okay there, but if you would like to be a part of that, I certainly don't want to exclude anybody, so please uh, come and, uh, and let me know. Uh, our church softball league is getting ready to, uh, to kick off here. I believe their first game is tomorrow. Um, and so there's a sign-up sheet out in the narthex. If you haven't done so already, but you want to get in on some softball, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, if you have any questions about that, contract, contact Patrick or Dietra Fraley. Their phone numbers are here in the bulletin. Uh, let's see. Let me throw everything on the floor. Then, uh, this week we had kind of a unique opportunity. Uh, we've been working with Habitat for Humanity for a while now, uh, sending volunteers on a regular basis to help build some of their homes. Uh, even our Sowing Seeds Quilt Ministry has also now tried to get involved in supporting them in making quilts that we can give to the families as they move into their new home to kind of celebrate. And they've been making some special quilts, and this week they had the first opportunity uh, to actually go and be there at the home dedication uh, to, to share these quilts and to give them uh, to the families. And so uh, a special thank you to all of our Sowing Seeds Quilt Ministry folks, uh, and especially for Patricia for taking the time to go up there and being there for that dedication. Um, we are actually meeting, uh, I'm having lunch with some of the people from Habitat for Humanity tomorrow. Uh, I'm sure they want to discuss lots more of opportunities and ways in which we can uh, help out with that uh, that. Um, Uh, that ministry. And so uh, beyond that, there is another day coming up, work day coming up at the end of August. Sign-ups are out in the narthex. If you're interested in helping to uh, build homes for those who need them, uh, please do so. If you have any questions, you can talk to myself or you can talk to Dale Hallibert. Uh, Let's see. Coming up on August 12th, there's a special one-day workshop and retreat for ladies um, that's called a treat shop. It's put together by the LWML in the Indiana District, Uh, and so it's actually going to be at Emanuel Lutheran in Tipton, Indiana, which is in another time zone, Um, and yet it's a little bit of a ways, but it can be a very good, uh, good kind of experience, and especially it's not so big a deal that it's far away if we maybe organize a carpool or something, and so if you have any interest in participating in that, uh, you can talk to, I would say, talk to Susie Flugheft, but she's not here today. Um, So talk to her another time or reach out to her or whatever else. I'm sure she knows all about it. Uh, Our deaconess, Karen Eck, she also um, has been a part of LWML here in the district for a while. She can probably answer any questions uh, too. And again, especially if you're thinking, hey, I might like to go, but uh, that's a long way for me to go all on my own. Um, Let us know. We can maybe connect you with some other folks to head down there for that. And then uh, some people have been asking, again, Dorothy Lentz, a member of our congregation who's moved down to Tennessee, she passed away uh, last week, Um, if you would like to send a sympathy card or anything else to her family, to her daughter, uh, the mailing address is there in the bulletin, so feel free to look at that. Uh, There is a a brief funeral service planned for August 19th. I don't have any more details than that as far as time, Uh, but feel free to mark your calendars if you'd like to be there for that. It'll just be a small service out at the cemetery, Um, but it would be a a good, wonderful opportunity for our congregation, uh, which she and her husband were a part of for very many years, uh, to be there and uh, show our our love and support to their family as they gather and continue sort of grieving as well. That's all I have in terms of announcements. There's certainly more in the bulletin. Feel free to take that home and, and take a look at things. Is there anything else anybody has to share here this morning? 
All right. In our Bible class today, we're going to hopefully wrap up, hopefully wrap up our discussion on the sixth commandment uh, with everything. And so uh, we'll get to move on to a new topic then. Uh, Please stick around and join us for that. Beyond that, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.